A couple of things. Uh, it's very bright up here. I can't see you. If you're raising your hand or if you want to talk, I will ask for, I do see you. Uh, I will ask for some audience participation. And you're probably going to have to yell because uh, I'm practically blind and definitely blinded right now. Um, but yeah, building a company culture worth giving a shit about. Uh, when I think about some of the things that I'm really excited to talk about all the time, uh, even if people don't want to listen, like my dear friend Josh right here, uh, who I talk with all the time. Uh, I, one of those topics ends up being company culture. Uh, it's also one of the things that I see uh, a lot of people have misconceptions about, whether you're a business owner, whether you want to start a business, whether you're an employee, a leader, anywhere in a business. There's a ton of misconceptions that at least I see about how I think company culture should be thought about, how you should run a company, and how at the end of the day, what it should do is really foster uh, the ability for the company to provide a better outcome for its clients. Uh, and so the, I submitted a talk, and for whatever reason, the people who decide who gets to talk said, put Connor on the main stage and give him, give him an audience. So here we are. Um, thank you. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Uh, so thank you for being here uh, and deciding to spend some of your time with me, and I'll get into it. Um, I was going to put a bunch of other pictures up here, and I ended up, couldn't, I couldn't find them on the plane ride over. So you just have this one. It's me smiling. Uh, but there's actually a really funny picture of our entire team. Um, I'm Connor. I run a small company called Finn, some of which are up here in the front wearing Manta Ray outfits. Um, and uh, it's uh, one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done. Um, I don't have kids yet, so that's not a knock to the parents here in the audience. Uh, it's also one of the most stressful things I've ever done. It's one of the most anxiety-inducing things I've ever done. Uh, I've had wonderful people, like some of them. Okay, I'm going to be pointing to these people a lot, by the way. I'll start pointing to others in the audience, so you can all pr pretend you're a part of it as well. Um, so it's, it's been a mixed bag for sure, but on the whole, it's been amazing. Um, and so one of the reasons why I actually wanted to talk about that today is if, there, if I ever had an opportunity to convince a business owner or a leader to think about culture in a slightly different way that improved the lives of the people that work there, that would be awesome. I'd really appreciate that, and vice versa. If I could help one employee understand that they can also create culture that they enjoy at a company and that it actually should work for them and it ends up being a net positive for the business owners anyway, I want people to feel empowered. Right? They have the ability to work somewhere they enjoy and then actually help direct uh, how that company operates. So company culture misconceptions. Um, for those of you who have talked with me, I've probably quoted a, a guy by the name of Alan Watts before. Does anyone know who Alan Watts is? No? Josh does. That's because I've quoted him. He's not a math guy either. Uh, all that you see out front of you is how you feel inside your head. So when I was thinking about co company culture misconceptions, one thing that was evidently clear through my conversations with employees who had just started organizations or owners who had been running companies for decades it was that most of the misconceptions were not based in reality. It was just miscommunication between a bunch of different people across sometimes decades, sometimes years, about a variety of things. Transparency, communication is super hard. Uh, and so one of the first misconceptions that I see about company culture is that benefits are the culture. Your salary, your PTO, your health care, anything. Uh, and I see a bunch of people taking pictures. I do have all these written down into words at, like, at the very end of this. So it's not just all pictures. So you'll, you'll, I'll stop and I'll, I'll call it out. Um, but one of the things that I'm going to introduce today is what I think is actually a framework through which companies should evaluate their own company culture. And at the end of the day, your benefits aren't your culture. It's actually what I believe to be like the table stakes for building any amount of culture. So if your employees are at all worried about their health, their wellness, um, or, or their ability to go pursue fulfillment outside of work and you don't give them that opportunity, that's like the base layer of their needs that you need to help them solve or that your business owner should help you solve as well uh, before you can do anything as a company. Uh, the second misconception that I see widely held is nobody wants to work anymore. And right when I thought about describing this, I immediately thought of this from the New York Times right here, which I ended up having to cut it off because I didn't want to put like seven slides of all the quotes from newspapers, but these are newspaper clippings uh, across all the way from 2022, and that last one is 1970. Uh, and it's every single generation, not just mine, not just those that came before me, all saying the same thing, which is nobody wants to work anymore. 
So this is not, company culture is not a, uh, a unique thing to today. It's not a unique thing that people, I'm air quoting for those of you looking at the screen, uh, people not working anymore. Everyone works. Technology makes things way, y'all are in technology all the time. It makes things way more efficient. Doesn't mean that people don't want to work. Uh, and so that's just one of the misconceptions that I see as well, largely held by business owners. Uh, and so if anyone's a business owner or a leader, uh, there's definitely a, um, there's a difference between having this mindset and wanting to know that your employees are being productive. And I often don't see that being struck uh, very well. And then I made, I made two memes. I'm a huge meme lover, by the way. So here's two memes. Um, on the left here, we have largely the perspective of a lot of employees that I talk to, that there's a greedy employer, greedy owner uh, that ends up siphoning away a lot of the profits or a lot of the revenue of a business, and the employees are left stranded. And then vice versa, I talk with a ton of business owners as well who believe the exact opposite, that the employees are greedy, they want more uh, for doing less, and that there's this fundamental disconnect between, all right, if, if everyone believes these two things or falls in one of these two camps, they, neither of them can be true. It has to be somewhere in the middle. And so clearly, again, the, uh, one of the common themes we'll end up seeing here is that there's just a lot of misconception all around miscommunication of if you, if you're an employee and you actually want something out of your business, you owe it to yourself. And, and I'll talk through how to do some of these things later on in the talk. You owe it to yourself and your business leaders and everyone around you to actually be really vocal about that. If your business isn't working for you in some way, like the best thing you can do for everyone involved is to just be honest and transparent about it. Even if that is something that you don't think your business will offer you, I'm a big proponent of like, you got one life, you might as well enjoy all of it. Uh, and sometimes that means pursuing other opportunity. And that's how you know it's authentic if it just happened. So um, when, I, when I thought of like, how should a business actually think about company culture? I wanted to take it out of a lot of, everyone has anecdotes about how they've been treated, about how they wish they would be treated, about how their business operates or it does not operate. So I wanted to try and create some kind of framework that everyone could at least evaluate on their own, even if you're an owner, a leader, or you just started at your organization. Uh, and I immediately thought of something I learned in honestly high school psychology class, which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, one thing I was always reminded of is that if like businesses live, breathe, grow a lot like people, and if that's the case, my immediate thought was, all right, well we should be able to have a like a like direct correlation between the self-actualization of an individual, the needs going all the way down to physiological, that we should also have in a business. So what would it look like to actually explore that uh, and to figure out what are the needs of a business at each level of self-actualization, respect, self-esteem, status, belonging, somewhere, actually being safe, and then also just having your base needs taken care of, like food and water and clothing. So what would those look like? So. If you're working at a self-actualized business, like what is the peak of a business? It's operating, it has satisfied clients, it has satisfied employees. What are actual, what's the actual thing that a business should be able to say that it makes it evident they are self-actualized, so to speak? They have achieved perfect company culture. And in my mind, that was the statement, we are the best at what we do. Unqualified, not we are the best at what we do on Mondays, some of the time, or on days ending and why would be all the time. So all the time, we are the best all the time. Um, and if that were the case, we are the best at what we, would, we do, what would we actually need the next level down to be able to make, and make that statement and back it up? Was well, that everyone in the business is rowing in the same direction? That's a, you know, a common company phrase that everyone hears all the time. Like, we all just need to be rowing in the same direction so that we're all pushing in the right way. I honestly think that phrase is over, overused, so I try not to use it but everyone needs to be aligned. Um, if you're serving a group of people that not everyone in the business wants to serve, and I don't know how many of you in the audience are owners or, or work at MSPs, but everyone can think of a client right now that they really wish they didn't serve. Or a group of them. Or maybe it's all of them. If it's all of them, you know, stick around and we can have a really great conversation after. Um, but everyone has that, and you know, I'm a, I'm a dirty, rotten vendor. That's the joke I make. I'm a vendor, right? I'm not an MSP. I've never been an MSP. Um, but it's absolutely the same for us as well. It's like, is there a group of clients that we fundamentally don't like to serve? And if you really ask yourself that question and dig down into, all right, well, why don't we like to serve those people? 
if we're not all completely aligned on serving them, why is that? And you usually arrive at one of two realities. I don't like the way these people talk to me. Um, so to, to talk on that for a little bit, uh, I was a property manager, for anyone who has been a property manager, congratulations on your new career not doing that, because it sucks. It is horrible. Uh, I can't say enough bad things about it if I'm being honest. Um, but one thing that I learned very quickly was um, if I inherited a client, if I inherited an owner or a set of tenants, right, when you manage a new property, you get both. You get the owner of the property, you also inherit the tenants. Um, I always had problems with the way that both, not just the owners and not just the tenants, would talk to me. And it wasn't because they were being inherently disrespectful. It wasn't because they weren't being truthful. It's because they were never, uh, like I use the word trained, but we had never discussed with each other how we would like to talk, how we'd like to communicate, whether it was respectful, timely in nature, or what it ended up being about. Or honestly, some of the best owners that I ever worked with, they didn't want to get talked to at all. They just gave me the credit card and let me swipe it. Uh, that requires a lot of trust. But um, that's, that's one of the areas that I see. The second is, it's, a, it's what I call a, a stretch client client that you decided to serve because you wanted the revenue isn't really in your sweet spot. And so if, you're, if you ever find yourself working with either of those two clients, clients that don't talk to you correctly, you haven't had the opportunity or you haven't been intentional about changing the way they communicate with you, or it's a stretch client, you'll find that it's very grading on the entirety of your company. And if it's not grading right now, it will be. So if you've just brought them on, if you're, if you're thinking of a client that all of y'all just brought on, you don't quite like the way that things are going, or it's a stretch client, maybe it's not in your wheelhouse, maybe it's not uh, in a regulated industry that you normally serve, you will arrive at a point where it's very grating on your business because the rest of your clients that you do enjoy serving, there is very little friction in providing services to them and making them happy. They, their service will gradually degrade as you continue to focus on the stretch clients that you've brought in. And so one of the most interesting things uh, that I've thought about is like, well, at what, like what actually, how do I know it's a stretch client before I take them on? And it's uh, honestly an almost impossible problem in my mind. I'm sure, I'm gonna point to Josh here. Josh can tell me all the time. He's like, I knew that. Don't, don't take on those clients. So listen to Josh, that's my advice for now. Um, there, are, there are definitely some questions you can ask yourself um, and I'm very talkative, so I'm not gonna go into them right now because I have a ton of the presentation to get through, but there, is a, there are a few ways that you can identify a stretch client um, that all just ends up being, are you honest with yourself and that client? Did you ask very hard questions in the onboarding process? One question, one question that I actually ask in a sales process is, have you already made up your mind that you're not gonna work with us? Ask that and I stop talking. And sometimes the answer is actually really interesting. Sometimes it's, actually, yeah, I have. It's like, great, what do you want out of this? And other times it's, I actually haven't, but why would you ask? I don't want to waste your time, you don't want to waste mine, and honestly, you want things that aren't quite what I do. So why are we here? Uh, it helps you arrive at a better way to evaluate clients. Third step is um, employees are fulfilled by their work. I'm using we, because I imagine there's a ton of employees in the audience, there's also a ton of leaders. You have to be fulfilled by your work. A statement that I live by is everyone in your business, including yourself and your employees, will always do what they believe is in their best interest and the, in the best interest of their families. Almost all of that, that qualifier, what's in their best interest, comes down to where do they get their fulfillment from. For some people, it's working nine to five, not a minute past, going home, spending time with their kids, or for me, like playing video games or golf or lacrosse or anything. For some people, it's that. For others, it's working all the time, it's meeting with clients, it's feeling important because you're showing up and you're solving problems really quickly. You have to get really good at figuring out not only what gives you fulfillment individually, but what, um, what gives your employees fulfillment if you're in control of their lives, of their employment and how it works. The next step is safety. We will continue to work here. There's two, two facets to this. One, the business will exist. And so if the common thread of owner and employee transparency was, not, transparency was not made apparent, I always tell MSP owners the following thing. If you're not transparent with your employees, they'll always assume the worst because they have no reason not to. And so if you find yourself in the audience not getting the transparency you want from your owners, whether it's financials or whether it's honesty about opportunity or whether it's the clients that you will or will not serve or any facet of your business, 
uh, that's an example of insecurity in, in the business that eventually you're going to, it's gonna build up, it's gonna build up, it's gonna build up until something breaks. That's what I've seen. I've seen that trend happen over the last four years of being in this industry. And the second part is, am I gonna have a job? So is the business gonna exist? Am I gonna continue to work here? Sometimes the answer is, I don't wanna continue working here. Then you got a really interesting problem on your hands, but at least you know that this isn't gonna be in your future. Then the very bottom of the pyramid, again, which most people confuse with the entirety of company culture, is benefits, PTO, salary. And you can sum it up in your employees and your, you do not worry about your health and your wellness. And wellness does not just mean physical wellness. It means mental wellness, emotional wellness, spiritual wellness, however you need to qualify that for yourself. Again, it all goes back to employee fulfillment. It is impossible to be fulfilled if you're worrying about health issues or, ma or making payments on healthcare related debts or anything like that. So there's a lot that business owners uh, would have responsibility for, uh, and this is the very base layer of it. This is not where responsibility ends, it's actually where it starts. I always liken it to a phrase, I think it was my dad that told me, is like marriage is the starting line, it's not the end. That's how I view PTO benefits and healthcare as well. It's like it is the start of taking care of company culture and building it, not the end. And then, I just put in, what would, it, what would be an example of how do we actually know we've self-actualized or we've taken care of physiological needs, safety, belonging, esteem, that you have raving clients, mostly. Now, everyone has clients. You, you know, sometimes get upset or sometimes you mess up. That's okay. You have vision and mission fulfillment. Is what your business is set out to do, not what it's doing today, but what it's set out to do, actually fulfilling. Uh, and if you can't find yourself getting really excited about that, probably find somewhere where you're getting excited about that. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why a lot of people really enjoy working at nonprofits. It's because it's usually incredibly fulfilling work. Very strong alignment on mission, very strong alignment on fulfillment opportunity there. Um, cultural alignment. Uh, this is a, I guess this is a tricky one, cultural alignment of the people is what I'm talking about here. Because there are people of all walks of life, all creeds, nationalities, origins, beliefs, it is not about actual like belief alignment or everyone has to think the same way or act the same way or do the same things. It's just cultural alignment on uh, some very base things um, that Josh and I thought were really important when we were building our business are things like, are we actually transparent? And a question that you should ask yourself is, are we only transparent when it's convenient? When it's very hard to be transparent about a very uncomfortable truth, maybe it's the performance of somebody that you work with, maybe it's your own performance, Maybe it's the financial security or the financial health of the entire business or of your business unit. Are you transparent about that? And if you find yourself not being transparent about that, uh, it's evidence that you don't quite have cultural alignment. It's one of those very core things. There's very few things that you should be willing to die on a hill for. But those that exist, they exist for a reason. Transparency is one of them. Safety needs, job and company security. The only thing I'd like to reiterate here is if you don't have transparency from the top, it just leaves room to assume the worst, and it's always, the worst is always gonna get assumed. Because there's no reason not, there's no reason not to assume that. And then benefits, PTO and salary. This depends on a lot of things, such as like where you actually work in the world and working conditions, whether it's remote or in office. So these can change, different for every company, but this is definitely the base of the pyramid. So how do we create some of this? Like, uh, I actually wanted to put the meme up here of Dave, Dave Chappelle, if anyone knows about it. Anyone, uh, anybody got some more of that good company culture? Shane knows exactly what I'm talking about. I opted not to for a couple of reasons, but um, we, can, uh, we can move on. So actually, Amanda, um, I hope I'm not gonna mess up her last name, La Chappelle, is that how it's pronounced? Uh, she's giving a talk called The Culture Triangle. So actually, I, I talked with her several times before giving this presentation we were building our presentations together. And this is the first excerpt of her presentation down here. So I'm kind of, I'm doing the wonderful thing of introducing and complaining about all of the problems and then giving you none of the ability to go actually help face. So I get the really easy job. Um, Amanda's gonna dig into is like, how do you actually have transparent conversations? How do you know that there's transparency that exists? How do you build trust between each other uh, and within a business? Amanda's gonna go into a lot of that. And her talk, you know when her talk is by chance? I don't either but it's in the, it's in the Whova app. It's in the Whova app, H-W-O-V-A. Go download now. Uh, so 
Um, and she's also one of the new board members. Um, I would highly recommend it's a great place to start if you're thinking that you'd like some of that. Um, one thing I do want to go through, the leadership exercise that actually I believe Josh I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't about it at the beginning, if I'm being honest. Um, our executive coach taught us. So one thing I wholeheartedly believe in, not, not about company culture, executive coaching. If you want to be an executive, if you are one, go get one. Because uh, usually people will blow smoke. They won't really tell you the truth. Your executive coach does not care. He'll, he'll tell you you're screwing up in, a, in more ways than one, and a lot of times you need to hear it. So I want to go through this exercise. This is the fist of five. You hold up a closed fist. Uh, you can all hold it up with me, or you can't. I'm going to do it anyway, if you, if you participate or not. And then you ask yourself a question as a leadership team. So this is normally for an exercise for a leadership team, but you can do this for any group of people. And you ask a question such as, I'm going to count to three, and I need you one through five to give me your answer. It's like, curly fries are better than steak fries. All right, so I, wanna, I actually want the answer to this, by the way. So curly fries are better than steak fries. One, two, three. This guy has a one. All right, you can leave. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but here's why this is important, right? So there are a couple of things uh, within your company that are really important you're wholly aligned on. And the exercise of going through where everyone, uh, we've done this at our company, it's one thing that's worked for us, so it might not work for you, but it's something I would highly encourage is you ask yourself a hard question. One question we ask ourselves is, do all of us here in our leadership, te leadership team actually believe we are MSP first? That was a question we actually asked our leadership team and actually went through this exercise. And one person had a three. Only, well, they didn't have one. They had one person out of three. And it immediately started roughly an hour and a half long conversation around some things that we were doing that didn't quite align with that statement. At, at, the, like, at the worst, it was an opportunity to help that, under, that individual understand maybe their perspective wasn't quite right and there was other information. At best, it was an opportunity to redirect the company to actually be more aligned with that company goal of ours, which was to be MSP first. So whatever those goals are for your company, uh, it's something that's really important, and it also, it, it, doesn't let, it doesn't let the truth hide anywhere. Everyone votes. Everyone has their opinion, uh, and there's no shame in having a one, two, or a three, but if you have a three, anyone has a three on your leadership team on items that are that important, you can't move on. You have to stop, and you have to talk about it, or you will start to pull each other apart. The second thing is uh, an organization alignment. I don't even know. Is that the right word for this? I just called it that. Playbook, a playbook. I'm going to show you uh, some of our playbook. It is nothing that you need to create, but it's definitely some of the things that we would be comfortable sharing, not only with the public, but with each other. And, it, and, and I've already seen the way it's matriculated into the company. Is it will suggest to do things. Maybe it's about a client or the way we sell or the way we build. And, it's, and it always comes back to is like, well, is this actually in our core values? Is this, uh, the way my executive coach put it and some of my other advisors is, if it's a core value of yours, it should be everywhere in your company. Not just the people stating it, not just your actions. It should be in your branding. It should be in your marketing. It should be in your messaging. It should be in the way people talk to you. They should feel everything that's in your core value. Um, and evidence of really great company culture is when you have the, you know, we have four things here, pride in what we do, forged in fire, MSP first, and seriously fun. It's when everybody in the company really is aligned on those core values. And you'll see that not all of these, actually only one of them is really business related, which is the MSP first one. The others are just about who we are, how we operate, how we'd like to be, who we'd like to be. This informs the way you talk to each other, the things that you talk about, the people that you end up becoming, right? Because a lot of this is just a journey for the owners and for the employees alike. It's all a journey. Um, and our actually the one that was most debated on is the first one, seriously fun. What, what was that you suggested first? Yeah, humorous. Humorous was not a good core value. Seriously fun is, though. But you have heard of it. Yeah. So um, there are a bunch of other things in an organizational doc that I didn't quite want to share uh, in this presentation. I also don't want to make this about Finn. It's more about there are definitely certain things, certain topics you should be addressing as a company. And if we had a, a place of business, we weren't remote, I would absolutely print this out and put it everywhere. Like if at any point anyone in the organization at any level is suggesting any initiative or doing anything that, that cuts against these four, any of these four values, stop what you're doing and bring it up and talk about it. Because either you're not committed to the value or you're doing the wrong thing and you need to know which one. Four toxic beliefs and what to do about them. So 
I can stop for questions here. I'm about to get into four toxic beliefs that I actually, I see a lot of employees have, a lot of it out of um, not resentment, but resigning themselves to believe they don't have the ability to create and inform good culture, and then actually how to switch some of that. Anyone have any questions? I don't know, am I allowed to solicit audience participation? I guess it's my talk, I'm the guy with the microphone. So yeah. Uh, do you want to know how in general, or how do I specifically do that? Um, so how do I specifically do that? Uh, the quickest way, share the bank account number. Don't share access to the bank account. Uh, that's the very quick, that's like you want to cut straight to the chase, that's the answer. Um, there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, what I would suggest is if you're a business owner or if you're an employee, there are expectations that, you, I'll, I'll talk about it from an employee. There are expectations that your leadership has of you that require financial support. Uh, and so financial tra transparency in that perspective might not be sharing the bank account number because sometimes that's not always very helpful. But it, what it would be is, what actual amount of support am I getting? Where is it coming from? And how much of it is actually left? What time frame do I have access to this capital or maybe it's people on? Um, that's what I would say. It's like sharing the, the expectation that is unsaid almost. I'm sorry, I'm trying to see you. Sharing the expectation that is usually unsaid would all be centered around those things. Like you're, you're telling me that you, you're giving me responsibility. What actual resources do I have to be responsible with? One more. Let's get into toxic beliefs. This is the best part of the presentation. Um, I have little control over my company culture. That's a thing that I see a lot of employees resigning themselves to. Is they believe um, either it's a result of previous companies they've worked in or the one they work in today. They don't believe, and maybe some of you in this audience, don't believe that you can actually change the company you work at in any measurable way to be to help you be more fulfilled or to provide better outcomes for your clients. Uh, this is usually prominent in companies struggling with internal communication. Uh, what I mean by that is all of the uncomfortable truths centered around, are these our core values or are we not quite aligned? Sometimes those can be very tough conversations. I actually was talking to a, uh, another vendor in the vendor hall about an uncomfortable conversation they had all centered around a core value there. Um, indicative of lack of belonging, and I'll just scroll back. What I mean by that, not belonging in like the actual sense of the word, the, the belonging phrase of the pyramid, or piece of the pyramid. And very common in culture by committee. Uh, I think culture by committee is actually where culture goes to die. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting combination of top down and bottom up is how you actually create culture. Every employee in your company, whether you believe it or not, and even all of you sitting in the audience, you create culture every day. and You influence it in some fashion. Uh, and so even if you have one person, uh, you know, I can think of several examples in my own life from places I've worked where one person in the entire organization just made it a hell, hell on earth. And probably people, I hope you all work there. And maybe if they're in the room, you don't need to react. But um, there are definitely people where, you, where you're like, that one person who may have been one of the you know, most junior employees at the company somehow had an incredible impact on your mental health and your business's culture. And it's just weird how outsized that impact can sometimes be. So when I say culture by committee is where culture goes to die, it's because usually when you set up that paradigm, you believe that only the people in the culture committee can impact culture. It's their responsibility. They're smarter than us. Their whole job, they do it. And what you've fundamentally robbed everyone else in the company of is the, the responsibility that they actually have to build good culture themselves. So it's, just, it's, an, it's an everyone problem. It's not just a committee's problem. Uh, the reality is you are the company culture. Um, you, can't, you can't have a company without people. Uh, so you can't have company culture without people as well. You know, the law of transitivity, they say. Um, culture cannot get set without your consent. Know, you get to vote with your two feet if you want to go elsewhere. I, I recognize that there are a lot of times where it's not as simple as that. But culture cannot get set without your consent. There is a lot of opportunity you have to change the way your owners or, or the way your company runs. And culture means n nothing if it doesn't work for you. If you're working at a place that doesn't quite work for you, two things are going to be true. You're going to burn out. You're going to want to get away. Bad things are going to happen. You're going to feel unfulfilled. There's just going to be a host of negative impacts on your own life. Also, are you able to actually do good work for yourself, for your, for your coworkers, and for your clients if you're not having a good time, if you're not fulfilled? I don't think the answer is yes. I think it's actually going to be no. 
Second one, my business leaders don't need my help. Speaking as a, as a business leader, even though it's, it's a small business, a lot like y'all's, uh, we, we don't have a very good idea what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> most of the time, we don't. Uh, I'll be honest about that. So we have a lot of inklings. We have, a lot of, we have frameworks, and we've seen the way things work at, in other areas of the organization or at other companies for other owners that we talk to. But we absolutely need all of your help. Um, I actually think the primary job of a leader is not letting people in the company, whether that's a bad client, a bad hire, a bad contractor. I think that's the number one priority of a business owner and a business leader is not letting people in the company because of how damaging it is to actual company culture. A prominent and top-down decision maker. Um, that is true. If you believe you're actually robbed of the ability to create an impact, it's usually because of the way decisions get made at your company, which there's, you know, there's a lot of benefits to doing top-down decision-making. There's a lot of drawbacks. Just wanted to point that out. Uh, I actually don't want to talk on ideality because I talk on this really a lot. Oh, only no, you know how you feel. I wanted to bring this up. I was actually writing this point on the plane. I wrote the whole presentation on the plane, just being honest. Um, thank you. Thank you. I had to buy the internet package. American Airlines still charges $19.99. Um, only you know how you feel. Uh, I was actually talking uh, with Josh about this on our way out of the airport, where it's, um, what are you doing if you don't tell the rest of your business how you honestly feel about the direction, the mission, the vision, the alignment, however you'd like to say essentially the words culture. Uh, well, essentially, uh, how, I would em how I immediately thought about it is I am getting robbed of your input. You are robbing me of your insight. Only you know how you feel. I have no idea. I could probably try to, I could try to guess, for sure, I can assume. And assuming is never a great place to be. Uh, but only you know how you feel, and so if you're ever at a place where you're like, my owners don't care, my business leaders don't care, people don't care, I, it's not gonna matter anyway. I would like to flip that paradigm, and I'd like to help y'all recognize, you are robbing your business owners, your leaders, your managers, whoever it is, or, your, or even if you're feeling that way with your employee, you're not coaching it out of the people that report to you, you're getting robbed of how they feel. Sometimes, sometimes you will be absolutely shocked at the feedback they will give you, positively and negatively. You'll be shocked in both cases. Company culture takes away from the bottom line. I hear this so many times from business owners. Um, and I don't know if it's quite uh, a difference in the way companies get built, because you know, every company's different. It, it is a living, breathing organism. And every company's different. You serve different people. You do different things. You have different people working with you. Um, I actually think... In order to be, in order to go through the framework, in order to be a self-actualized business, in order to be the best at what you do, you need great company culture. So when somebody says company culture takes away from the bottom line, my point is like, of course it does. Because if we don't have, but it doesn't matter, if we don't have company culture, we can't be the best at what we do. Nobody cares about the bottom line if the business isn't succeeding. And so I always thought about it as a prerequisite to success. And if it is a prerequisite to success, Bottom line doesn't matter because the business isn't going to be here anyway. Uh, so that's how I've always thought. Of, that's how I'd encourage you all to think about it as well. Your business can't succeed without you. So I'd like to, again, empower the folks in the audience. If you're a part of an organization, your business can't succeed without you. You know, you could probably put the brakes on and try to sabotage it from within. Maybe not for long, so don't do that. But um, if your business is going to succeed, it is only a result of the creativity that you have. It's not the not the result of some boring process that uh, you guys are all process nerds. I probably shouldn't bring that up, but um, it's not the result of following a process over and over and over again. The real reason businesses succeed is because of the creativity of the employees. And then this all feeds back into that's why the primary job of a leader of an organization is to figure out who not to let into the business. Because it's your job to hire creative people and let them be creative. I actually think that's uh, it's on one of these slides coming up, so I'll just say it. Uh, your job is to hire creative people and let them be creative. And I wasn't joking about the, you know, business owners oftentimes need a lot of your help. I wasn't joking about that. They actually do. And maybe this doesn't, just doesn't get better. I see a lot of that in the MSP industry uh, for a lot of reasons, right? You're looking at enterprise IT jobs and you're like, man, I can make twice my salary if I just sell my soul to enterprise, right? I could work half as hard. I could get one of those fancy chairs I see all those, those videos online. Those are like 500 bucks. My boss won't give me one of those. Um, you see all that, right? It's a, a hard thing to do when your skills, 
when the knowledge that you've gained, when the experience that you have is worth so much at enterprise, and then so you work at an MSP, why is that? Usually the answer is, I know exactly who I'm serving, I know the community I'm, in, I'm impacting, I know the control I have over what we do and why we do it. I can look into the person's eyes when I reset their password, I hope you're not, because that's horrible. But uh, when you're helping them, you're not just helping, you're not just answering a ticket, and uh, you're not faceless, you're not nameless, and the person you're serving is not faceless and nameless. You actually get a lot of value, it's incredibly cathartic to solve problems for people that are in your community that you care about. And so uh, what I would say is culture is easy to define, very hard to achieve, uh, a statement I made earlier, I'm trying to remember it, is uh, culture is not a destination, uh, it's essentially the race. Like it, you show up every day and you create culture whether you want to or not, you don't get to a point, you're like, all right, we're done, we reached the top of the pyramid. Uh, because if you stop building, if, you, if your culture becomes stagnant, you're moving backwards, you're undoing all of the work that you've done for you know, yourself and your company. And I actually don't agree with that. I'm making sure I'm on my toes here. How much time I got? I got seven minutes. I got you for seven more minutes. Um, beliefs every leader should have. So that I'm actually done the culture presentation, but these are some of the thoughts that I've had for quite some time over how leaders should operate. And you don't need to be a leader in a business in order to be a leader of individuals. Right? Anyone can be inspiring. Anyone can be charismatic. Anyone can be caring and empathetic. You don't need to have a fancy title in order to do that. Um, sometimes it's helpful though, but you don't need that. Uh, and so some of the things I'd like to, all of you to leave with today is be transparent, especially when it's hard. I made a statement earlier that was along the lines of, if you're only transparent when it's easy, you're not actually transparent. I think that's true. There are many times where your core values will get tested very exactly. Do I tell this client that XYZ happened, that we didn't quite, were the reason that, that, we, that their service is messed up, not, I don't know, insert some other company they didn't know. If transparency is one of your, your core values, you have a decision to make. Do we actually believe this? Do we wanna be transparent? It's really hard right now, and they might get really upset with us, or is, are we gonna take an easier path and not be? So be transparent, especially when it's hard. And I find uh, if you make it a, like a rule, we are always transparent about everything. Uh, it's much easier to stay committed to a statement like that than it is, oh yeah, we are always transparent, asterisk. Except in this situation, and this one, and this one, and this one. You can think of incredibly difficult situations to not be transparent in, but if you, you keep adding asterisk to it, uh, it makes it easier to add more. Uh, this is one I get in trouble with by a lot of business owners, by the way. So I guess if you're a business owner and you're taking pause with it, shield your eyes. Uh, the majority of your employees' fulfillment comes from outside of their work. This does not apply to business owners and leaders. It does not. It applies to your employees. Uh, the majority of your fulfillment, at least in my perspective, and again, I guess I'm the guy with the microphone, so I get to say all my opinions, uh, is I think work should be an incredibly small portion of your fulfillment overall, as a, as a human, not just in IT, but overall. There are so many things. There's, uh, you are more than your job. You're more than your thoughts. You are more than your actions. You are you're human. You get fulfillment from your hobbies. You get fulfillment from your friends, from your family, from playing D&D &D and eating pizza last night. Uh, growing up, that was a lot of fun for me. I was very large growing up. I'm not making a joke about my size, but $5 Little Caesars hot and ready was my go-to. <laughs> it's now like seven bucks. Inflation sucks. Um, so um, this is usually where I see a lot of um, owners kind of take up uh, issues with because it means that they need to prioritize fulfillment that their employees are gonna get outside of their work. And if you tug on that thread a little more, you'll arrive at better PTO, better benefits, better salary. It's like, it doesn't necessarily need to be better if you're already at a great place, but it, you need your employees to arrive at a point where they feel like they have the ability to pursue fulfillment not within the confines of their job. That's a very hard thing to do and oftentimes very expensive. Your employees are the opportunity. I've believed this from day one, uh, speaking as a very horrible software developer myself, hiring competent developers <laughs> was quite an opportunity, let me tell you. Um, you hired them to creatively solve your problems. That's essentially what employees do. They're, they're creative individuals that solve problems creatively. 
if they don't need to be creative, you know, we have AI tools that'll, that'll do everything for you. And if your answer is, well, AI tools can't do that, it's like, great. But we need creativity involved in some capacity. So letting your employees be creative. Uh, and the last thing, I see a lot of leaders, I see a lot of people in general struggle with this in their personal lives too, so I wanna leave this with you. Kindness is not empath empathy, it's not empathetic. The worst thing you can do for your company culture and yourself is to be dishonest about opportunity and ability. So if somebody's not, qu not quite living up to expectations, whether that's your business owner, whether that's your boss, whether that's an employee that reports to you, or whether that's a coworker, or anyone in your life, you owe it to them to actually be honest about it. Because if not, resentment builds. And if that's within the confines of your job, that means your culture is going to deteriorate little by little by little. Your relationships with the people you work with will as well. And so that, that's usually one of the hardest things to actually practice in real life is willing to offend people with what you believe to be uncomfortable truths. Always have a good conversation about it. Always be honest about it, but at least you gave them your perspective. And sometimes you might lose a friend over that, or sometimes you might lose a coworker over that. But if it was actually the truth, it still needed to be said. We got these two jokers showing up late. <laughs> and the last one, I believe this is the last one. Yeah, we're not gonna get to Connor's mixed bag of holding. Take more responsibility you sh than you should, take less credit than you deserve. This doesn't apply to just people in a position of leadership. If you practice this day in, day out, I promise you, people, uh, actually selfishly, people will like you way more, by the way, if you give them credit for everything, they just, they'll love you. Uh, so take less credit than you deserve, take more responsibility than you should, and you'll usually end up in a better place where people, friends, family, anyone, will be, will be willing to help you. And that is, you know, if I look back at uh, myself and my journey over the last four years, the one thing that I've done really well is be likable. And it wasn't because I wanted to be likable for nefarious reasons, it was because I, I wanted to like people and I wanted them to like me back. I wanted to have genuine relationships. That's, that's like the bedrock of company culture, genuine relationships. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here. I can put these on the screens if anyone wants to take a picture, but I'm done. I'm not going to mic drop. It'll make a loud noise. anyone have I know I'm like up at time does anyone have one I'll definitely stay after so I don't I can give the mic back if somebody's trying to make a point here question yeah uh, so oftentimes what I see at, com um, at companies is there's either a small group of leaders or a group of people that aren't quite leaders that are um, in control of deciding what are the benefits what are the PTO what are the salary how do we communicate how do we communicate the vision uh, or as the gentleman asked, like the level of financial transparency we have in or as an organization. Um, and I think what that does is it, it makes it, it shifts the whole company's perspective from every, this is everyone's problem that everyone needs to help solve and be aligned on to oh, only these people need to care about it and have input there. So culture by committee, if, you've, if there are a select few people and it doesn't need to be something called the culture committee, nothing like that. It can just be the group of people that actually delegate how people should think about these things. That's culture by committee. Sweet. Well, we are up at time. I don't have you for any more time. So, I uh, thanks all for joining. I'm Connor. I don't have a picture of myself actually. I could scroll back to the top. Hi. Thanks for joining. <laughs>